Hey folks, Andy Patton here. The Zags secured another big win last week, this time over the Dons of San Francisco before they got an off day on Saturday. I'm here to answer listener submitted questions all episode long. It's Mailbag Monday after all, right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to take you through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by Sonos. Sonos is the official sponsor of ESPN College Football. Go to Sonos.com to learn more. I also want to thank all of you who have carried over listening to the podcast as your first listen of the day. It is very, very much appreciated. Those of you who have checked out the show on YouTube, I appreciate you as well. The YouTube channel has grown tremendously over the last couple of weeks. One of the fastest growing YouTube channels in the Locked On Podcast Network. If you have not checked it out, please do so. I redid the homepage. It looks fantastic now. Go to youtube.com, search Locked On Zags, hit that subscribe button. It is very, very much appreciated. All right, today is Mailbag Monday. A reminder for those of you who have not participated in Mailbag Monday, if you would like to, super, super easy to do so. You can tweet at me at scorezagscore or at Locked On Zags. Whenever you are thinking of a question, let me know you want it for Mailbag Monday. I will put it in my note sheets and I will get it answered while I record the show. You can also email me at andypatton013 at gmail.com. That is how we're getting most of our Mailbag Monday submissions. It's great for people who want to submit more than one question at a time or those people who would like to submit Mailbag Monday questions as well as hot takes for Andy Locks, which usually airs on Thursdays. You can submit them both at once via email if you would like to as well. All right, getting right into it. Segment one, this first question comes from Bryce Hendricks. At Bryce Hendrick 14 on Twitter, he says, do you get the impression that both Nolan Hickman and Hunter Salas are going to return next season? If so, do you think that's a core that can compete for another title? Folks, it was the Hunter Salas Mailbag Monday episode today. I'm not sure why we ended up getting a lot of questions about him. This question, uh, do I think that's a core that can compete for a title? Yes, but it obviously depends who else is there. Two players do not make a title contender. Certainly two freshman guards coming into their sophomore seasons are not necessarily enough to make a title team. Uh, Obviously, if you have those two, if you have Dominic Harris back, Uh, a guy we have not seen this year yet at all, but is almost certainly going to be a big part of the picture next season. And then Julian Stroth, another player who's kind of right on that bubble of whether he's going to go to the NBA or come back. If you have Hickman, Salas, Harris, Strother all back in the mix, if you get a couple of transfers, if Anthony Black commits to Gonzaga, something that we have not heard a definitive answer yet, but he's a top 20 player in the class of 2022. If he comes to Gonzaga, rounds out that guard rotation really nicely. Anton Watson's, of course, going to be in the mix as the four or five. You're going to have Ben Gregg. You're going to have Caden Perry. You're going to have Braden Huff, a new new player in the class of 2022 who just had an excellent performance in high school recently. Video came out about that. He looks fantastic. There's the potential for Drew Timmy to return as well. I've talked about that on this show a handful of times. If Gonzaga's season doesn't go as planned, I could see him running it back for another season, I think that's definitely possible. And of course, Gonzaga has been really good at hitting the transfer market well. So I think they're going to they're gonna replenish their roster in ways that are going to keep them competitive. I think that these this team and last year's team are probably their best chances at titles. I don't know if next year's team will be quite as good, assuming they lose Chet Holmgren, of course, Andrew Nembhard and Rasir Bolton as well. But they have always replenish their roster in ways that keep them very competitive. As for my thoughts on whether these two guys are going to return this next season, John via Gmail asked a similar question saying, what do you think the probability is of Julian Strother, Hunter Salas, and Nolan Hickman leaving the team next year, realizing that important games are still on tap to be played? Yeah, I think a lot of these decisions really get cemented or finalized after March, obviously, when players have had the opportunity to really present themselves well in a setting that is viewed by a lot of people. 
There wasn't a lot of expectation that Zach Collins was going to leave uh, after his freshman season until he had a very, very excellent performance in the NCAA tournament. I think that's the kind of story we could see with any of these three guys. If they really pop off in March, it's almost certainly more likely that they're going to leave. Uh, I will give some percentages here, though, because I have been giving some percentages on some of these guys in the past. Uh, Strother, I think, is really close to 50-50. It's really hard to say right now. He's obviously had a great sophomore season, has really showed his ability to be a capable 3 and D type player in the NBA. Obviously, NBA scouts really like younger players. So the longer he stays in college, that can potentially hurt his draft stock. I think right now he's probably 55% staying, 45% leaving, but it really depends on how he does in March. Uh, Hickman, I've I've talked about him in the past. I've, I've said that I think it's a very good chance he leaves. I still think I'm sticking with like 60, 40. He's leaving to the NBA, 40% staying. But again, if he struggles in March or if they play Andrew Nembhard 38 minutes throughout the NCAA tournament and Hickman just doesn't get off the bench all that much, then I think it's more likely that he stays, leads the offense next year. He's going to be incredible as a sophomore if he does end up coming back. Salas, I think, is the most likely to stay. He has played the least out of this group. He was the highest rated recruit, however, out of the group. He was number six, I believe, in ESPN's top uh, top prospect rankings for that class. Same number as Jalen Suggs, obviously has not performed the same way as Jalen Suggs, has not played the minutes that Jalen Suggs played, but is still on a lot of NBA draft radars. radars. I see a lot of people releasing mock drafts or big boards who still have him on there, despite the fact that he is Gonzaga's number four guard. I still have him up 65% staying and 35% leaving. But again, one or two nice games in March, even if they come off the bench, even if he only plays 18 minutes, but he really pops off and a significant game in the NCAA tournament, that could be enough for to sway him to end up leaving. All right, speaking on Hunter Salas, F.R. Etling asked this question via Gmail. He said, do you know why Gonzaga has played so little of Salas this season? He was a five-star recruit going in, so it has been annoying and underwhelming to see the coaches squander his ability. Can you discuss why few could be keeping him on the bench so much? Wow, okay, so some words that I'm not sure that I agree with here. Uh, Annoying and underwhelming. I don't think Hunter Salas has been underwhelming in terms of his performance on the court at all. He's been one of Gonzaga's most efficient scorers. He's an elite finisher around the rim. He's an absolute havoc creator on defense. One of the best perimeter defensive guards I have ever seen in a Gonzaga uniform uh, and squandering his ability. I, I don't see that at all. He just hasn't, he hasn't played because they're they have other really good guards. He came to Gonzaga knowing that there was a lot of other really talented guards on this team. He committed before Nolan Hickman, obviously, so he may not have known that, but he also committed knowing Dominic Harris was in the mix and was likely going to play. He's getting treated similar to the way Dominic Harris got treated last year or even Julian Strother got treated last year. Now, he's playing more than both of those guys played last year. I think Strother played about seven minutes per game. Dom played about four minutes per game. Sal is playing more than that. But I don't believe that his ability is being squandered in any way, shape, or form. I don't believe that there is an obvious person that he should be playing more minutes over. He's raw. He's a raw player. He's not a good outside shooter. He hasn't displayed much of a mid-range shot yet. He's a really good finisher around the rim and a really good defensive player, which is the role that he is being utilized in is to be a great backdoor cutter, is to be a, a ferocious rebounder, and to be a great defensive player. He's playing the role that he is best capable of doing. Next season, assuming that he returns, he will take on a lion's share of the of the minutes. He will play more minutes. He will probably display more of an outside shot. I don't think that anything that is being done by this coaching staff is in any way squandering his ability. I don't believe that his performance has been underwhelming at all. I think that he is the fourth guard. When you have a roster like this, when you have a national championship contending roster, if you look back at other teams that have won at all, or other just like elite dominant top to finish college basketball teams. They have dudes like this playing roles like this. This is normal. It's not normal for Gonzaga for most of the school's history to even have players of this caliber recruit, but it is normal for teams that are at this level to have really, really good players playing reserve or small roles because you just have to have talent wins out. Basketball is a talent sport. It's five on five. It's not 11 on 11 like football is. It's not uh, as big as baseball rosters are, it is five on five. So you need to have as many super talented dudes as possible if you want to win the ship. And Gonzaga has that in this roster. And when you have that, you have guys like Hunter Salas and like last year, like Dominic Harris and Julian Strother, who are good players who just are not playing 30 minutes per night because there's other good players on the roster ahead of them. 
All right, next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, the new transfer portal has had an immense impact on college basketball. What are your thoughts on it, especially as it relates to the Zags? The Zags were already deft in utilizing it to find grad transfer guards in particular. It seems like the Zags have cracked a code that is now more widely available. Is the transfer portal better now or just much more widely used? Yeah, so that's an interesting point that I hadn't fully thought about all that much. But yeah, Gonzaga did have, seem to have an advantage in terms of how they were utilizing the grad transfer portal. They weren't doing anything that other teams weren't capable of doing other than being, you know, they were able to, to get high level players to come to Gonzaga for a year because they knew that they had a potential to win a championship. Jordan Matthews came, hit a big shot, almost won a national championship. Certainly Byron Wesley was a big part of that. Gino Crandall, Admon Gilder, Ryan Woolridge. They've had a ton of grad transfer guards that have really helped out in that regard. Now, because players are able to transfer more easily, because the transfer portal makes it easy to put your name out there and then decide to come back to school because you don't have to sit out a year, there's a lot, a lot more people in the transfer portal. I think the transfer portal is largely good. I understand why some people get frustrated with it. I understand why certain people in mid-major programs get frustrated seeing all the best players from the smaller schools go to bigger schools. I can understand why that seems a little unfair, but... It's unfair to, to force student athletes to stay at a school or punish them severely if they want to leave. Sitting out an entire year of your collegiate career is, is, is a tough sell. It's hard to do for these athletes, especially if they're not hurt. They're just losing a year of being able to play basketball. It's tough to ask athletes to do that when they went to a school where their coach was uh, you know, abusive or left early when they had committed to going there to play under a specific coach. And then the coach leaves. Coaches don't have to sit out a year when they leave. So if a coach bounces to a new job, they can start right away. And these players are now previously were forced to, to sit out a year if they wanted to transfer. That didn't seem very fair to me. If you're just not getting the playing time and you know you're capable of playing at a different level, if you want to get more viewed by more scouts and you know going to a different school is going to do that. I, I don't think it's fair to ask college athletes to commit to a school for four years and there's no exceptions at all, or there's a deep punishment for them to leave. So I'm glad they have more autonomy. It's kind of a part of the greater movement in college sports to allow their athletes to have more autonomy. They obviously can now get paid for their name image likeness, something that was not an option for the vast majority of student athletes prior to this year. Uh, now it is something that they can do. They can get paid for their likeness. They can transfer more easily. It's giving them more power, more autonomy in a, in a field where they give up their bodies for previously no money whatsoever in a billion, billion dollar industry. So I'm happy to see that be the case for Gonzaga. They will continue to be really, really deft at finding the right players on the transfer market. I don't think it's going to change for them. They have been extraordinary at it. Look at Rasir Bolton this year, a perfect fit for what Gonzaga needed. Mark Few sees the puzzle pieces on his roster better than any coach in college basketball, has the ability to go out and get the kind of player that he needs, not just in terms of their basketball skills, but their willingness to fit on the roster. He is really good at going out and finding those guys. I don't think that's going to change. There are going to be more options to choose from, which I guess means it's more likely that you pick incorrectly, but I trust this staff to find the right guys to fit this team. All right, we got more listener submitted questions coming up in the second segment. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about GetUpside. Hey, Zags fans, Andy Patton here with an incredible app everyone who buys gas needs to know about called GetUpside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free GetUpside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code SCORE and get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price of the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free and use promo code SCORE to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much to two to $300 a month in cash back, and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code SCORE to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. All right, folks, Andy Patton here to introduce our new Locked On Zag sponsor, Homefield. Homefield Apparel is a premium college collegiate apparel brand out of Indianapolis, offering incredibly comfortable, officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. Homefield is kicking off a big new Saturday season three, where they launch a new school on their site every Saturday for eight straight weeks. Gonzaga is week two. 
Home Field digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. And they are launching the Gonzaga Collection on January 29th. The Zags Collection has 14 pieces of apparel in the collection, including t-shirts, hoodies, and crewnecks, all vintage. I have seen the designs, and trust me, you're going to have a hard time narrowing it down to just one or two or three pieces of material to buy. It's comfortable fabric. It's fun and unique designs. This is cannot miss Gonzaga gear that you all need before March Madness. New customers can get 15% off their first purchase from Homefield using code LOCKEDONZAGS at checkout. That is homefieldapparel.com, promo code LOCKEDONZAGS for 15% off your next March Madness apparel. All right, segment two, Andy Patton still locked on Zags, and we're still going through questions for Mailbag Monday. This next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, with Auburn's win over Kentucky, we will be revisiting the number one question again. I like how you pointed out that the Zags fans should remember how special, cool, and amazing this is. I wonder if you could share what it was like to be on campus when the Zags were ranked number one for the first time. Yeah, I've seen this uh, quite a bit. I think Gonzaga fans want to keep being number one, obviously. Uh, and so they were, they, there, there was some discussion on Twitter, we'll put it that way, about Auburn fans who desperately wanted to be number one and thinking that they deserved it last week. And there was certainly a strong argument and even more compelling argument for them this week, I suspect. By the time you're listening to this, there's a good chance that they are the number one ranked team in the country. We, that they ha- This hasn't happened to them. And we have to remember, it wasn't that long ago that it hadn't happened to Gonzaga. And it's such a monumental, special moment. I know it's different when you're looking at a small basketball school versus a school like Auburn that has been ranked number one in football <laughs> multiple times and has won national championships, whereas Gonzaga has not. But I can understand how special it would be for the basketball program for them to be ranked number one. For me, I was a student teacher when Gonzaga was ranked number one. I was in my second semester of my senior year at Gonzaga, and I was working at Ferris High School in Spokane. And so I was not on campus for the cake cutting ceremony. I was not there for that, unfortunately. I was a member of the Kennel Club board, so it was heartbreaking for me to not be there uh, in an event that was kind of celebrating the students and the student section in particular uh, for for having this. This is a monumental occasion, but I did get to celebrate with high school students who were super excited about it as well. Uh, That was really fun to kind of get the opportunity to be in a different space. Uh, Obviously, I did not go into teaching, but uh, I still really enjoyed my time as a student teacher and getting to share that moment with them and kind of share the NCAA tournament experience with them. Uh, It was hard to come back to work the next day after the Wichita State game, I will tell you that, but it was still a, a really fun opportunity to be a student at Gonzaga when this happened. Christian goes on with his question. He says, also, it is very likely that Auburn is number one, leapfrobbing the Zags without the Zags losing. The real question this brings up for me, how does the team continue to grow so that they peak at the right time? I think one growth area is utilizing different styles, game tempos, and areas of emphasis. The USF game was a positive sign in this way because the Zags did not shoot well from three, and Drew Timmy had a very human first half. What other challenges that the Zags face down the road in the big dance might they be able to work on and address during the WCC season? Yeah, so as much as people don't like this argument, it is difficult for Gonzaga to improve upon things when they are playing opponents that are not challenging them to the level that opponents in the NCAA tournament will challenge them. They are fortunate that they face uh, two more two more games against St. Mary's, one more game against USF, one more game against BYU. That's four good games, not including the games in the WCC tournament, which will likely include those three teams as well. Those are NCAA tournament teams, uh, so or at least very should be NCAA tournament teams, hopefully. So it does help them that they have those teams. They also face teams with very different paces. Obviously, St. Mary's plays this very slow, methodical, plodding pace that allows them to really slow down Gonzaga's tempo. San Francisco does something similar. BYU is a great outside shooting team. There are some other teams in the WCC, while they're not as talented, who can still move, push the pace a little bit and give Gonzaga some different looks that they haven't faced. But ultimately, it's it's difficult for Gonzaga to work on some of the things that I think they need to work on, most notably handling ball pressure better. This is something that they struggle with against Alabama. They struggle with against Tarleton State. They struggle with against Duke. And most notably, they struggled in the NCAA championship last year against Baylor. There aren't a lot of teams in the WCC that play that style of defense or that have the capability of really frustrating Andrew Nempard and Rasir Bolton and Nolan Hickman and, and Gonzaga's guards with the basketball in their hands. 
I would also like to see Gonzaga really play really good lockdown perimeter defense, something that we've seen them slip on a little bit in the season, especially against Alabama. They played really poor perimeter defense in that game. So again, there are some good shooting, uh, good three point shooting teams in the WCC. So Gonzaga could get punished if they don't guard the perimeter well. So I would like to see them tighten that up a little bit, but again, it's tougher because they're going to play a lot of teams that aren't going to challenge them all that significantly by, by the time they get to March. All right. Next question comes from Jacob quarter two on Twitter. He says, when looking at some of the best teams in the nation, which teams in particular do you think Gonzaga being heavy favorites and which teams do you think will give this Zags teams fits? I don't know that there's a lot of teams in the top of the, <laughs> the top rankings that Gonzaga are going to be heavy favorites against. I think that there's a pretty good chunk of good teams in the country. I do think some teams that are going to give some Gonzaga some trouble, uh, no surprises here, Duke, Auburn, and Baylor. Uh, obviously, Duke has already beaten Gonzaga. We've seen the recipe. Gonzaga was right in that game. Very, very capable of winning it. Duke was also capable of winning that game by more than three points. Had Ben Carroll not missed a large chunk of the second half, they could have secured an even bigger victory in that game. Baylor, obviously, is a much different team than they were last year when they won it all. There's no Jared Butler. There's no Macy O.T. There's no Davion Mitchell. But this is still a very good team. Kendall Brown is extremely good. They have, they're have they really well coached in Scott Drew, and they play a similar really aggressive defensive style. So they would give Gonzaga trouble. Auburn, of course, Jabari Smith is a freaking stud. He's going to be a problem for every team in college basketball. He already has been. It's going to continue to be an issue. And, and they play a really intense defensive strategy they're good on offense good on defense they would give Gonzaga some struggles I think Gonzaga matches up a little bit better with like a Kentucky team I don't think Purdue would give them all that much trouble even though they have a lot of size in the front court I, I don't think that they would be a huge issue for Gonzaga I think they could handle that one I think Gonzaga could win against Kansas certainly uh, UCLA obviously is a team that Gonzaga has proven they could beat quite handily uh, and they're a top 10 team in the country USC uh, is has fallen a little bit but is also a team I think Gonzaga would beat uh, pretty significantly. And I don't know about Arizona. I just don't know. <laughs> that would be a really interesting game. I think that I don't think that either team is going to have a significant advantage in that game. I think that one would go wire to wire. All right. Last question for segment two comes from Jim on Facebook. He says, the Zags seem to be getting in the habit of starting games slowly. Any thoughts why? Yeah, I think BYU and San Francisco were the main reasons, uh, the main culprits, at least in terms of them starting slowly recently. I think the answer is, is pretty simple. It's that both those teams are really, really well-coached teams who had really good game plans against Gonzaga that surprised them. USF basically got Gonzaga to do exactly what they wanted them to do for the first few minutes of that game. It was a masterclass in coaching from Todd Golden. They had a, they executed perfectly. They had Drew Timmy to, taking wide open threes, which he was missing, which was what they wanted to do. They were pushing the pace. They were controlling the tempo of that game. And then Gonzaga finally kind of snapped out of it, woke up, went on a little run. And then at that, from that point forward, Gonzaga kind of handled things. It still stayed close for a while, but Gonzaga, once they got their rhythm going, they were fine. BYU is just very, very good and shot really well in the first part of that game. I don't think Gonzaga is coming out slow is necessarily an indicative of them being unprepared or them being sluggish or anything like that. I think it's more that other teams like have these, like th this is the game they prepare for more than any other game that they play. This is the game that's circled on their calendar all the time and they come out ready to roll right away. And sometimes Gonzaga gets punched in the mouth a little bit early because they weren't prepared for what the team was going to do because they spent a lot of time trying to come up with the perfect way to beat Gonzaga. Very few teams have figured it out. Nobody in the WCC has. They figured out how to stop Gonzaga briefly early in the game and Mark Few and the staff make adjustments. The players kind of, you know, wake up a little bit and then things end up just fine as they have the last couple of games. All right, two segments down. Coming up, we're going to answer even more Listener submitted questions, but before we get there, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. Bet Online would like to wish you all a happy new betting year as we continue our march to the playoffs and beyond. Even in 2022, Bet Online remains the number one spot for all of the best sports wagering action. In fact, with the new year comes a new updated desktop and mobile website. Sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to get started. From football, basketball, hockey, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for 2022. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all of your favorite sports. 
Today's episode is also brought to you by Built Bar. It's the new year, so that means New Year's resolutions. If yours is about getting fit or eating healthier, make sure you include Built Bar in your plan. Built Bar is the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bar makes it easier to stick to your resolution because it tastes so good you'll want to eat it, unlike other protein bars, which can be chalky or waxy or taste like a chemical spill. You want to eat healthy, but it just gets so boring. By now, you might be thinking, this is just not worth it. Where's the chocolate? But Bilt Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. In fact, here's an idea for the new year. Go to your secret treat stashes at home, in the pantry, in the office, the car, wherever. Throw out all of the sugary or calorie-filled treats and replace them with Bilt Bars. So when you're craving a snack or a treat, you can reach for something that's healthy and tastes incredible. Even if you're not a huge fan of working out, you can at least eat something that tastes good and is good for you. That way, when you enjoy a delicious Built Bar, you can almost count it as a workout. Go to BuiltBar.com, or excuse me, go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still answering listeners submitted questions for Mailbag Monday. This next one comes from John via Gmail. He says, if both Holmgren and Timmy leave for next year, how do you think the front court plays out? Slash, can Watson play the five, or would we need to hit the transfer market for a starting five? Yeah, I think Watson is probably more suited for the four. Obviously, he's a great perimeter defensive player. He's not really a great rim protector. He doesn't have the size or the length to necessarily play that role. Plus, having him be a rim protector would take away his greatest skill set as a perimeter defensive player. I think Ben Gregg plays more of the four role as well. I do think Caden Perry could be a five. I think that's more the role that he is capable of playing. He's not a good outside shooter. He's not a good perimeter defensive player, but he is a good, 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 super athletic rim protector, good shot blocker, good low post scorer. kind of plays more of the traditional five roles. I think if Timmy and Holmgren leave, Gonzaga will certainly check out the transfer market to try to bring in a high profile post player if they can, because they'll be left with Perry, Watson, Greg, and Braden Huff. Not the worst big four that they've ever had, certainly. But if this team has title aspirations, I could see them going out and trying to find a starting caliber five or somebody who can at least compete with Caden Perry to start at the five. That just gives them a little bit more flexibility in the front court. Doesn't rely as much on some of those younger guys who have played very few or in Braden Huff's case, zero minutes uh, at the collegiate level. Next question comes from Christian via Gmail. He says, the Lady Zags are looking good and heading towards a date with BYU on February 5th. Against St. Mary's, Kaylee and Kayleen Trung combined for 28 points and 7 rebounds, over 40% of the Zags' total points. What is the ceiling for this team? BYU's departure from the WCC really hurt the women's basketball in the West Coast Conference, maybe even more on the men's side. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so a couple thoughts here. Uh, BYU leaving does hurt the women's pro- the women's conference, I think, more than the men. Obviously, BYU has been a great high-profile men's basketball program, although they have only made four NCAA tournaments in the last 10 years and have yet to actually win the WCC. That is not true. On the women's side, BYU has been the powerhouse of the WCC. They are an outstanding women's basketball program. Losing them will hurt. We have seen some WCC women's programs step up in recent years. Portland has gotten much better in the last couple of years. I think that will help. But ultimately, yes, it will hurt the WCC's overall reputation as a women's basketball conference, but it will help Gonzaga significantly in the sense that they are much more likely to win those automatic qualifiers and get into the NCAA tournament. As for this year, I think this team has legitimate potential to be a Sweet 16 caliber team. They have played very, very well as of late, but they are still in second place in the WCC. They will probably make the NCAA tournament potentially uh, as a automatic bid or excuse me, as a um, at large bid if the if BYU assumingly wins the WCC, but it's going to be tough Uh, For the for the Zags here, I think that they have the potential to be really, really good, but they have also proven that they can struggle. So they're kind of a a mismatch right now. But Coach Fortier seems to always have this team grooving at the right time. They've played their best basketball in February and March the last couple of years. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens again this year. And with this team, their best brand of basketball could get them into the second weekend in March. All right. Next question comes from John. He says, are you hearing anything about Dom Harris getting closer to player playing and do you see ever see Nolan Hickman starting over Rasir Bolton at any time this year? Uh, regarding Dom, no, I have not heard anything. My guess is that if he's not back on the court by the first week of February or the second week of February, certainly, then he's not going to play this year. There's not really any reason to bring him back that late. 
into the season. Uh, just let him rest up, let him get super healthy, let him play next season. I'm not super worried about it. If he comes back, great. Another weapon for this Gonzaga team. If he doesn't come back, I don't think it's some big indication that there's something seriously wrong with him or that he's not good enough or anything like that. It just means that he wasn't quite healthier, that Gonzaga didn't want to introduce him back into the thing right before they started the NCAA tournament. Uh, regarding Hickman, I don't really see why there's a, a, a strong push to get him into the starting lineup. It doesn't really make sense to me. He doesn't need to start. He plays a more similar role to Andrew Nembhard. They're both facilitators. They're both passers. They're both you know, good defensive players, kind of keep the pace kind of players. And there's not really any reason for them to play the majority of their minutes together. It just makes more sense for Hickman to replace Andrew Nembhard. Obviously, he does play minutes with Andrew Nembhard, and then and that's fine. It's not a bad thing. But I think starting them both and then bringing Bolton off the bench just doesn't make as much sense. I would rather have Hickman come off the bench and kind of play the like backup point guard role, which he's really, really good at. Rasir Bolton's very good in the starting lineup. There's not really any need to make a change, I guess, is my primary point there. Our next question, the final one of the show, comes from Christian. He says... I feel like Gonzaga sports represent the campus community and collective energy very well. In other words, when I see a game, I think of my college home. Universally, I think this is one of the very special energies that is unique to college athletics, but it feels especially true for Gonzaga. How do you feel about this? Are we homers for our college home? First of all, everybody is homer for their college homes. Everybody thinks that their school is the best family atmosphere, that their school has the best community, that their school is the best at so and so and so and so. And that's fine. That's a, that's what makes college sports college sports. That is a totally acceptable way to feel. However, Gonzaga is in a unique position. Their unique position is pretty simple. They are a small school with elite collegiate athletics. There are not a lot of other schools that are like that. The big, really, obviously, college football dominates everything, but the big college football programs, the big FCS schools, are huge schools, 40,000 students. And a lot of them are also the really good basketball schools. Clearly, Auburn is an example of that, but Kansas, Kentucky, those kinds of programs, you know, Arizona, UCLA, whatever, are, are also football schools and are also huge universities. Gonzaga is way smaller than those schools. Way small. I don't know the most recent figures for Gonzaga's student population, but it's I think it's under 6,000. And those other schools are five times that, if not more than five times that. So Gonzaga can create more of a community feel. Students or alumni can feel more connected to the program, can feel more connected to other people who are Gonzaga fans than those schools can. And it's not that those schools are not trying to do that. It's not that we should blame them or laugh at them necessarily. It's just something that Gonzaga can organically do because of the size of the school, because of the size of the community. That just allows us to feel, I think, more connected because when we see other Gonzaga fans or other Gonzaga alumni, it's just a smaller group. If you're an Oregon fan and you see another Oregon alumni, it's still a nice feeling, I imagine, but it's different because there's so many people who are Oregon alumni. And if you live in the state of Oregon or you live in the state of Washington and you see Huskies gear or Ducks gear, it's just not as... It's, it's not as enriching of a feeling, I think, as when you see Gonzaga gear because it's a smaller school. There's less of it out there. And yet this program is also so good and is beating those schools and is better than those schools in basketball. So I think it, pre, it, it does create a different energy, a different feeling than other schools do. And, and part of it is what Gonzaga does. They do a good job of connecting with their alumni, of making them feel special. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it has nothing to do with Gonzaga itself, but it does have a lot to do with the size of the school and the success of the sports program that is unique to many other schools that are this size. All right, that is going to do it for me today. We got LMU and Portland this week, two nice WCC games coming up, plenty to discuss all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts, soon to be, or excuse me, already available on YouTube. Another reminder, podcast links will be available on Twitter at Locked On Zags and on my own Twitter account, which can be found at Score Zags Score. Finally, now is a great time to listen to the Locked On Bets podcast. Locked On Bets is your daily one-stop shop for all of your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.